All right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the DRCC seminars of the second semester of the year. Today, we have Julia Gerland, who is going to talk to us about neutrino CP violation in the standard model and beyond. Uh, Julia obtained her Bachelor in science of Science and Master of Science degree from uh, KIT in Germany. And then she moved to Instituto de Física Teórica at Universidad Autónoma de Madrid in Spain, uh, where she got her PhD funded by the UE Marie Curie Training Network Elusives. Uh, and then uh, after that, she moved to Brookhaven National Laboratory, where she was a research, research associate in the high energy theory group. And now she's uh, at CERN in the theory department as a senior fellow uh, since the beginning of October this year. Uh, her research centers around neutrino physics and massive flavor models, as well as physics signatures in the neutrino sector and connections to neutrinos uh, to open other open problems in the standard model. Uh, Julia, thank you for being here uh, and the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to talk to you today about neutrino CP violation in the standard model and beyond. So the observation of neutrino oscillations is, provides very strong evidence for physics beyond the standard model. But not even, uh, but even beyond that, it introduced new parameters to our model of nature. In fact, it introduced at least seven parameters, three angles, at least one phase, and the three neutrino masses. And of course, we want to measure all of these new parameters to understand more about the neutrino flavor cocktail, but also to better describe nature. Neutrino oscillations happen because the flavor eigenstates of the weak interaction and the mass eigenstates of the free particle Hamiltonian are not aligned for neutrinos. In fact, they are related via a mixing matrix, the PMNS matrix, which is given here. The uh, PMNS matrix can be parametrized by, at least by three parameters, three angles and one, and one phase, because we can write this PMNS matrix as a series of rotations. We have a rotation around the two, three axis, around the one, uh, three axis, and around the one, two axis. In addition, we also uh, choose to put the phase, which we need in the matrix, uh, into the one, three sector. And this phase is called delta, whereas um, the three rotation angles are called theta 2, 3, 1, 3, and theta 1, 2. Um, in addition, if neutrinos are Majorana particles, we also have two physical Majorana phases. However, uh, in the following, I'm going to talk about oscillation experiments, which are not sensitive to these Majorana phases, so I will not uh, discuss them further in the talk. So this leaves us with these four uh, parameters. So how do we measure the neutrino oscillation parameters? In general, um, the probability, uh, so if we have produced a neutrino of a certain flavor alpha with an energy E, the probability to detect the neutrino with a different flavor beta at a distance L is given by this expression in the two flavor approximation, where we only assume the existence of two different flavors, alpha and beta. So the probability, this depends on the mixing angle theta, and it also depends on neutrino mass splitting delta Mij squared, which is the difference between mass eigenstate I squared minus mass eigenstate J squared. And then this probability also depends on the distance L, which is called the baseline, and the neutrino energy. And here I show a plot of this oscillation probability as a function of L over E. You see that the amplitude of the oscillation is um, determined by the mixing angle theta, whereas the frequency of the oscillation is determined by the uh, mass splitting delta Mij squared which means measuring the oscillation probability can then give us insights into these two parameters, uh, the mass splitting and the mixing angle for known uh, distance L and energy E. And in fact, many uh, neutrino oscillation experiments have already conducted such studies, and um, we find an impressive agreement between these different experiments. To demonstrate this, I show here a compilation um, of a global fit of all the um, measurements of the uh, atmospheric parameters, which is theta 2, 3 and delta m3, 1 squared. We see here 
uh, the allowed uh, the uh, the regions found by uh, the T2K, the NOVA experiment, and the MINUS experiment, which are experiments which use neutrinos produced in accelerator beams to determine the oscillation parameters. And then uh, we also see the allowed regions by deep core and by super Kamiokande, uh, which are experiments which use atmospheric neutrinos to determine the oscillation parameters. However, even though these experiments use different uh, neutrino sources, have different detection technologies, uh, we find a very impressive agreement between them, such that we have now a good knowledge of um, the atmospheric oscillation parameters. We also, um, so conducting global fits to oscillation data is uh, important to obtain information about the mixing angles in the mass splittings. Uh, we have two different mass splittings in the neutrino sector. We have a large mass, spl mass splitting delta M213, uh, sorry, delta M31 squared, uh, which has um, a value of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 electron volt squared, and a smaller mass splitting delta M21 squared, which has a value of uh, 7.4 times 10 to the minus 5 EV squared. However, so far we only know the sign of this smaller mass splitting. We do not know the sign of the delta M32 squared. This means we do not know the neutrino mass ordering. Which is the question, is the, late, uh, is the lightest neutrino mass eigenstate, uh, does it contain the most amount of electron neutrino, then we are in the normal neutrino mass ordering, or the least amount of electron neutrino, then we are in inverted uh, mass ordering. Uh, so, in addition to uh, the knowledge about the mixing angles, we also have, uh, sorry, a knowledge about the mass splittings, we also have very good knowledge about the three mixing angles in the neutrino sector, and we know that all three of them are non-zero, and in fact they are actually large. We know that one mixing angle, theta 1, uh, 3, has a value around 8.5 degrees, uh, theta 1, 2 has a value around 33 degrees, and theta 2, 3 has a value around 45 degrees with a, a relatively large uncertainty still. So this means that we could even have a maximal mixing angle in the neutrino sector, theta 2, 3, where maximal means it's uh, 45 degrees. So the fact that the neutrino mixing angles are large is particularly surprising if we compare the neutrino mixing to the small mixing we observe in the quark sector. So here in these uh, two plots, I show um, the size of the elements in the, in the neutrino and in the quark mixing matrices. And you see um, that the quark mixing matrix is, ve is, is very diagonal. It has um, large entries on the diagonal and very large entries on the off-diagonal elements. Whereas in the neutrino sector, we observe that all elements ha have a similar uh, order of magnitude. Uh, where the 1, 3 element is the smallest uh, mixing element. So, uh, however, not only is it a little bit surprising maybe that the three neutrino mixing angles are uh, large, but the fact that they are non-zero, this opens the possibility to have CP violation in the lepton sector. And in fact, the parameter which governs CP violation, this is this phase delta, is currently the least known parameter of the neutrino mixing uh, parameters. And uh, so you see here, this is the three sigma region in red, and you see that delta can basically have any value between uh, zero and two pi. And of course, we want to measure this value uh, delta to also answer the question, do we have CP violation in the lepton sector? So uh, we already have sources of CP violation in the standard model. From weak interactions, we know that C and P are maximally violated. Uh, from the strong interactions, uh, so far we have not observed any dipole moments uh, for the neutron, for example. Uh, so it seems like in strong interactions, CP is conserved. Uh, why this is the case, we don't know. This is in fact the, um, the essence of the strong CP problem. So um, how's the situation in the lepton sector? Um, CP violation in mass matrices, like in the quark sector or in the lepton sector, can be best quantified in a basis invariant called the Yaskog invariant, which is defined as you can see here. So this Yaskog invariant, this depends on all the three mixing angles, theta 1, 3, uh, 1, 2, and 2, 3, and in particular, it depends on the sign 
of these three mixing angles. So only if all three mixing angles are non-zero, we can have CP violation. And, and yeah, exactly. So all three mixing angles play a role. And if you just maximize uh, this expression here for the Yaskov invariant, that you see the maximal value um, JCP can have is around 0 0.096. In the quark sector, we have already measured all the mixing parameters. We know the three mixing angles and the CP violating phase. We know that all the three quark mixing angles are non-zero and also the phase is non-zero. However, um, since the quark mixing angles are relatively small, the value of the uh, Yarzburg invariant in the CKM matrix is also relatively small. In fact, if you take the ratio of the measured value of the Yarskog invariant divided by the maximal value this invariant can have, you find a value of 10 to the minus 4. So the question arises, what about the lepton sector? Is um, CP violated in the lepton sector and how large is the Yarskog invariant? So far, we only have an upper limit of the ratio of the Yarskog invariant in the neutrino sector divided by uh, the maximal value of the Yarskog invariant, and we find that its maximal is 0 0.3, which still um, uh, leads to the possibility that we could have a quite big uh, CP violation in the lepton sector. So how do we measure CP violation in neutrinos? So first of all, CP violation can only take place in appearance experiments where you um, measure the probability that a neutrino of flavor alpha transforms into a neutrino of flavor beta. Um, you cannot have CP violation in disappearance experiments where the neutrino alpha stays, uh, neutrino of flavor alpha stays in neutrino of flavor alpha because this channel is T invariant. And if we assume that CP3, CPT is conserved, this channel also is CP invariant, which means we always need to look at appearance experiments. Then we also need a channel where all the three flavors play a role because we need the interference of two contributions in the probability to have a CP violation. And finally, the easiest way um, to measure CP violation is to compare the neutrino oscillation probability with the anti-neutrino oscillation probability. Now this leaves us um, with uh, different appearance channels. Uh, however, since uh, technically uh, or experimentally, it is very easy to produce mu neutrinos. Uh, they, we produce them uh, in accelerators uh, from the decay of uh, pions and uh, also kaons, we are going to use as initial flavor of the neutrinos, mu neutrinos. Then this leaves us with um, the choice of using electron neutrinos or tau neutrinos as the final state of this uh, oscillation uh, experiment. However, tau neutrinos are very difficult to detect because we always detect the neutrinos while detecting the corresponding charged lepton. However, tau neutrinos have, uh, I mean, they're unstable and they have a sizable branching ratio into um, hadrons, which means you always have a very complicated uh, final state, which makes the tau, uh, tau neutrino identification in experiments very difficult. For this reason, um, experiments use the mu neutrino going to electron neutrino as the channel to look for CP violation in neutrino. And as it turns out, due to matter effects, this channel is also sensitive to the mass ordering. So there are currently two experiments which aim to answer the question about CP violation in the lepton sector, which is the NOVA experiment and the T2K experiment. The NOVA experiment is a US-based experiment which uses uh, neutrinos from the new Mi beam at Fermilab here in Illinois and then detects them in Minnesota here in Ash River with a far detector. The neutrinos have an energy around uh, 1.9 uh, GV and they travel a distance of 810 kilometers. The um, uh, as you can see, um, these neutrinos they encounter uh, as so they travel through matter from on their way to Ash River and um, there is a certain matter density the neutrinos encounter. Both near and far detector of these experiments are liquid scintillator. The T2K experiment is based in Japan. 
It uses neutrinos from the JPOC beam and detects them in the Kamioka mine uh, with the Super Kamiokande detector. The experiment uh, which originally detected for the first time neutrino oscillations and also a Nobel Prize got awarded um, to a member of the collaboration. The neutrinos in uh, T2K uh, have a lower energy of 0.6 GV and they also travel a shorter distance of 290 five kilometers in comparison to the NOVA experiment, and also just uh, geographically um, the matter densities the neutrinos encounter uh, for the T2K experiment is lower than in the NOVA experiment. Okay, so both experiments are uh, taking data and uh, two years ago at the Neutrino 2020 conference, both of them presented their newest results, which I show here. So these are the results of these two experiments are uh, given in the plane of uh, delta, the CP violating uh, phase and sine squared theta two three, one of the three mixing angles, uh, which is the mixing angle, which is uh, currently the, la uh, the biggest uncertainty. You see in blue, the preferred regions by the NOVA experiment um, at 90% confidence level and NOVA does not have any uh, particular preference for delta. The best fit value for delta is uh, around pi. However, NOVA disfavors its region around delta equal to 3 pi over 2 at 90% confidence level. In black, you see the preferred regions by the T2K experiment, which has a preference for exactly this region of delta equal to 3 pi over 2. This leads um, to a slight disagreement between these two experiments around the two sigma level. Um, there was earlier this year in summer, there was uh, another neutrino conference, neutrino 2022, where also both experiments uh, again presented data. However, the results were, um, are still very similar to the 2020 results. Um, uh, however, both experiments also analyze the data now in a different statistical framework and they still find the slight disagreement between their results. So what could be the case of this result, uh, of this discrepancy, and could there be new physics hiding? So can new physics alleviate this slight discrepancy and what kind of new physics could be responsible? And here um, we remind ourselves that there is a difference between the T2K and the NOVA experiments, namely the baseline and the meta densities the neutrinos encounter. Um, in fact, at NOVA, the neutrinos experience stronger matter effects because the matter density is larger than the T2K and the neutrinos also propagate a longer distance. So the new physics solution to this slight discrepancy could in fact be related to exactly this difference. So we introduced new matter interactions for neutrinos, which go under the name of neutrino non-standard interactions, to see if we can alleviate this slight discrepancy between these two experiments. The framework of these uh, new matter interactions, these uh, neutrino non-standard interactions, or short NSI, was actually already proposed by Wolfenstein in 78 and can be parameterized as you can see here. So we add now a new term to the Lagrangian, which describes new forward scattering interactions of neutrinos with matter. So we couple neutrinos of uh, flavor alpha and beta to meta fermions F, where F stands for electron up or down quark. Um, the strength of this new interaction is parameterized by this NSI parameter epsilon, which gives the strength of this new interaction relative to the weak interaction relative to the Fermi constant. Um, so these uh, new interactions, they affect neutrinos as a new matter effect in oscillations. So we have here the um, Hamiltonian which describes oscillations. Um, in the first part here, this uh, um, is just uh, the standard oscillation term, uh, sorry, the uh, term which encodes the mass splittings of the neutrinos in the mass uh, in the matrix M. And then we have here um, a matrix which depends on the meta potential A, which is proportional to the Fermi constant, the meta density, and the energy of the neutrinos. This one here, this is just the standard meta potential the neutrinos experience, uh, the electron neutrino experiences in the standard model. And you see here, if we have new interactions, we populate the whole matrix with this NSI parameters epsilon. 
You see on the diagonal, we have diagonal NSI parameters, which couple neutrinos of the same flavor to metafermions. And we also have off-diagonal NSI parameters, which couple neutrinos of different flavors to the metafermions. Uh, yeah, so because we are looking at an appearance channel, which is inherently flavor changing, we are going, we are focusing on the off diagonal NSI parameters, epsilon, alpha, beta, which we are going to split up into the absolute value of epsilon and its phase, phi, alpha, beta. Then together with my collaborators, Peter Denton and Rebecca Festus, in this publication, which came out uh, two years ago, we derived analytical and numerical values of the complex off diagonal parameters, which can resolve the tension. So let's first look at some analytical results to get a feeling of how big the NSI parameters actually need to be. So our basic assumption is that NSI only affects our measurement of delta, whereas the measurements of uh, theta uh, 2, 3 and the delta m squared, the mass splitting delta m3, 1 squared, remain unaffected. Then the oscillation probability in, in the absence of um, NSI parameters is equal to the oscillation probability if we have NSI parameters and um, we have a certain true value of delta. This is true for neutrinos and antineutrinos. Um, there are already analytical or approximate analytical expressions for the oscillation prob probability in the presence of NSI in the literature, which we use to estimate the needed uh, magnitude and phase of the NSI parameters. So for the, for the magnitude, Attitude, uh, we obtain then this expression here, which depends on um, the mixing angles theta 1, 2, theta 2, 3, as well as um, delta m to 1 squared, one of the uh, measured mass splittings. But it also depends on the difference of the measured values um, of delta from nova t to k, and it also depends on the difference between the meta uh, potentials in these two experiments. So we find that depending on if we're looking at epsilon uh, mu, mu uh, epsilon e mu or, or epsilon e tau, we find that uh, in general the magnitude of the NSI parameter needs to be around 0 0.2 to resolve the tension between these two experiments. We can also do a sanity check of these uh, of this expression and our results. If t to k nova measure the same value of delta. Then you see here that the needed value to resolve this uh, discrepancy is zero because there is no discrepancy. On the other hand, if the meta potentials in both experiments would be exactly equal, then you find no value of the NSI parameter which can resolve the tension because um, this NSI solution crucially depends on the fact that um, the neutrinos at T2K and NOVA have experienced different um, meta effects. Uh, so what about the phase of the NSI parameter? So we use that the measured values of uh, delta T2K and NOVA are different. We also use that uh, at NOVA the meta potential is stronger than at T2K. We find in the end that since um, uh, the neutrinos at T2K experience very little matter effects. The true value of delta needs to be close to the T2K value, and this leads us to uh, the result that the phase of the NSI parameter needs to be around 3 pi over 2. So we expect from our analytical results that the absolute value of the NSI parameter is around 0 0.2, the phase 3 pi over 2, to resolve the tension between T2K and over. So then let's go to the numerical results. Um, so we used, we did a fit to the appearance data and also the disappearance data for T2K and NOVA. So for the appearance data, um, we uh, fit our code or our, yeah, our code to simulate the experiments to the points on the by probability plot. And we also crucially included wrong sign laptops because as you can see um, in the antineutrino mode, there are some events um, which are neutrino events and not all the anti-neutrino events, uh, which is what one would expect. From the bi-probability plot, we also see um, here as a big cross, this is the measured value of number of events at T2K. And we see that in the neutrino mode, they found around 110 uh, electron neutrinos, whereas in the anti-neutrino mode, they saw around 16. So we're talking actually about a very small number of events in these experiments. 
Uh, for the disappearance data, we um, use the fit results from another, another publication, and we also use the provided likelihoods from the, for the T2K data. Sorry. And then uh, we also need information from other experiments for the remaining oscillation parameters. And crucially, we use um, information from experiments which are in vacuum. Uh, because these are vacuum experiments, um, they, are, they don't experience any NSI. Because remember, NSI is the, the strength of the NSI is proportional to the meta densities. If you are in vacuum, the meta density is basically zero. So we use um, for theta 1, 3 and delta m32 squared. We use the results from Daya Bay, which is a reactor experiment. Um, for theta 1, 2 and delta m21 squared, we use the results from Kamland, which is another uh, reactor experiment. And then finally, we also use from Snow that we know the sign of the delta m21 squared. So this allows us then to conduct a combined analysis of the T2K and NOVA data using priors on the other oscillation parameters and um, to obtain our numerical results then. And here are our results. So the results are shown in the plane of the absolute value and the phase of the NSI parameters epsilon e mu and epsilon e tau. Um, we assume, uh, sorry, these results are for the normal uh, neutrino mass ordering where we find the best fit um, to resolve the tension between T2K and NOVA. The orange regions, these are preferred over the standard modeled integer values of delta chi squared, whereas these dark gray regions here, they are disfavored at the delta chi squared of uh, 4.61. This blue star here, this is the best fit value. And the, uh, yeah, then we also have in dashed here constraints um, on NSI parameter from the ice cube experiment using atmospheric neutrinos. So we see that ice cube rules out everything to the right of this dashed line, which unfortunately rules out our best fit point. Nevertheless, here to the left of the line, we have nevertheless a very large region of parameter space, which gives a, an excellent fit to the T2K ANOVA data and which is not ruled out um, by ice cube. So um, these uh, constraints from ice cube, they are uh, very strong and very important because the effects of NSI, they grow with energy, distance, and matter density, which means epsilon, the NSI parameter epsilon mu tau is best probed with atmospheric neutrinos, whereas epsilon e mu and epsilon e tau are best probed with long baseline appearance or atmospheric neutrinos. Um, such as ice cube, uh, even though ice cube slightly disfavors our long baseline best fit point from T2K and NOVA, it prefers non-zero epsilon, uh, uh, epsilon e tau actually at the one uh, sigma level, as you can see here. So, which is of course very curious and uh, very interesting um, because this uh, preference for epsilon, for this non-zero epsilon uh, e E mu uh, is actually of a similar order of magnitude than uh, our best fit value. So yeah, um, there is also another uh, atmospheric neutrino experiment, Super Kamiokande, which uh, nevertheless so far has only considered real NSI. Uh, however, it has also comparable sensitivity to ice cube. And then finally, we can also constrain NSI from using neutrino scattering data, in particular using experiments which uh, look for sevens, which stands for current elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. Um, these experiments also provide similar constraints to the ice cube constraint. Yes, so now we can uh, compare our numerical results to our analytical uh, estimates. So as a reminder, we estimated that we would need values, magnitudes uh, of the NSI parameters around 0 0.2, phase 3 pi over 2, and a true value of delta also 3 pi over 2. And here at the table, we see uh, the results from our numerical fit. So we see that, in fact, um, our analytical estimates uh, were pretty good. So we find that the best fit can be achieved with absolute uh, with magnitudes of the NSI parameters around 0 0.2 phases, 3 pi over 2, and true value of delta also 3 pi over 2. In uh, total, we find an improvement in uh, introducing NSI of 4.44 over the standard model. And the best uh, result, the best fit is achieved if we introduce epsilon 
uh, EMU in a normal ordering, you see if we assume an uh, inverse neutrino mass ordering, the improvement over the standard model is uh, at uh, around oh, delta chi squared of one. So uh, we find that we can, uh, by introducing NSI, we can fully resolve the tension between T to K and Nova, which is of course very exciting. Uh, there is, we can also uh, go a different route and resolve the tension uh, slightly by swapping the neutrino mass ordering. So Nova and T to K individually prefer the normal mass ordering over an inverted mass ordering. If you combine T to K and Nova, you prefer the inverted ordering over the normal ordering at a delta chi squared of 2.3. Remember, if we introduce NSI, our delta chi squared goes up to 4.4, which means it's um, a better resolution of this discrepancy than just swapping the mass ordering. However, if we now include also super k data to NOVA and T2k, which still prefers the normal ordering, the combination of these three experiments still prefers the normal ordering over inverted. And uh, this, um, this solution can be probed uh, in the future with uh, future reactor experiments which will measure the neutrino mass ordering. Okay, so uh, the future of uh, CP searches in the neutrino sector is bright. So currently we have uh, the NOVA and T2K experiments I just talked about. In the future, we are going to have the DUNE experiment in the US and Hyperkamiya Kande in Japan. However, as I've showed you um, in, for, in the Yaskok invariant, actually all mixing angles play a role in our determination of uh, CP invariant quantity in the lepton sector, which means also a more precise measurement of the neutrino um, mixing angles and the mass splittings as well as the neutrino mass ordering will become important. So what's the future of CP searches? Uh, so NOVA and T2K, they are continuing to take data. There is actually an ongoing joint uh, experimental analysis between these two collaborations, uh, which we are uh, very looking forward to. Um, this complex NSI solution can be probed in the future with Dune and uh, Hyperkamiokande. And you see here on the, on the right um, the, um, the expected sensitivities of Dune in, in color compared to the current bound shown in gray here. So um, Dune will definitely improve our knowledge on um, NSI in the future. Um, the uh, standard model solution to the discrepancy between uh, NOVA and T2K, uh, namely the swap of the neutrino mass ordering for normal to inverted, can be also probed in the future with uh, the reactor experiment Juno combined with atmospheric neutrinos, uh, because the combination of these two experiments, this will get, definitely give us a determination of the mass ordering at more than five sigma. Um, yeah, but also um, just the search for CP violation will continue to be exciting in the future. So we see here that Hyperkamiokande will have a very good sensitivity to CP violation at more than five sigma. So will Dune, uh, shown here in the middle. And um, combining these two experiments, Dune and Hyperkamiokande, will also give us a very good precision on the value of delta, which I show here on the right. So the individual uh, T2K, uh, sorry, uh, Hyperkamiokande and uh, Dune, they will have individually a precision of uh, like uh, between 10 and 20 uh, degrees on delta, depending on the true value of delta. However, if you combine these two experiments, your precision will actually improve to be um, around the 10 degree level. Uh, yes, however, as I've already talked about, um, the CP sensitivity at these experiments gets impacted if we have new sources of CP violation, for example, if we have physics beyond the standard model. Uh, in the last slides, I talked extensively about uh, new neutrino interactions, NSI, which in fact introduce um, new phases. So uh, here on the right, I show the results of this uh, publication from a few years ago, where the author studied um, the impact of different uh, uh, NSI parameters and their phases. And you see that the sensitivity to CP violation can get drastically reduced depending on what uh, the values of the phases uh, from the NSI parameters are. But there could be also um, other uh, new physics beyond the standard model in the neutrino sector, for example, sterile neutrinos. 
if we have just one new sterile neutrino, the PMNS matrix is not a series of three rotations, but a series of six rotations. So we additionally introduce three new mixing angles and two new phases, which can be CP violating. And in this publication here, the authors have studied the sensitive, how the sensitivity of dune changes if we assume the uh, existence of an EV sterile neutrino, for example, motivated by the shot baseline anomalies, the reactor anomalies, or the gallium anomaly. And here you see um, uh, the uh, dashed the uh, nominal sensitivity of uh, Dune, and in colors you see what happens if we introduce new CP violating phases coming, for example, from the sterile neutrinos. And again, you see that they can potentially shift down the sensitivity of Dune. So uh, what is then the impact of the CP measurement we are very much looking forward to? So apart from measuring the, one of the last known parameters of the standard model and one of the last known parameters in the neutrino sector, a precise measurement of, of delta can also probe the existence of flavor models and potentially also disentangle different flavor models from each other. So I already touched on the fact that um, we observe a very large mixing in the lepton sector, which is puzzling if you compare this to the very small mixings in the quark sector. Finally, the reason for that is um, the idea behind flavor models, and our popular flavor models are based, uh, popular leptonic flavor models are based on discrete symmetries, and they generally predict that um, one of the mixing angles theta 2 3 is uh, maximally 45 degrees, which is still in agreement with current oscillation data. One of the mixing angles theta 1 3 is zero, which is definitely not in agreement with current oscillation data. We have measured that theta 1 3 is around 8.5 degrees with a very good precision. And the other mixing angle theta 1 2 is between 30 and 36 degrees, depending on the exact flavor model, which is also um, more or less in agreement with current data. However, the fact that these flavor models predict that theta 1 3 is zero, this uh, of course basically rules out this class of flavor model unless you can uh, correct these predictions. And a common correction to the predictions from flavor models can, for example, come from the charged lepton sector. The PMNS matrix is a product of the mixing matrix of the neutrinos times the matrix mixing matrix of the charged leptons. And these uh, flavor models, they generally predict um, the mixing matrix in the neutrino sector. But if you assume that now the mixing matrix of the charged leptons is also um, non-diagonal, then you could actually uh, bring the, pre the predicted value um, in agreement, predicted value for theta 1, 3 in agreement with the measured value, which is the value uh, in the PMNS matrix. Which means then also that the angles, the measured angles in the PMNS matrix are then a function of um, the predicted mixing angles in the neutrino sector and the predicted mixing angles in the charged lepton sector. And these relations go under the name of leptonic sum rules. They have actually uh, obtained quite some, um, some interest in the community a few years ago, namely, uh, like basically 10 years ago, actually, in the last SNOMAS process, um, which is a US process where um, the whole particle physics community kind of paves the way to the uh, to the future, what, do, what kind of experiments we want to build and how good or what should these experiments actually achieve, so what should be the goals of these experiments. And here I took a plot um, where the predictions from different sum rules are shown in color. And here you see that in order to distinguish different um, flavor models or different sum rules from each other, we need a precision of delta around 15 degrees, which is in fact the target sensitivity of the Dune experiment. So one of these sum rules, uh, this relates the measured value of theta 1, 2 to the predicted value of theta 1, 2, the measured value of theta 1, 3, and this then predicts a value for cosine delta, which is uh, shown here on the right. So that's very exciting. And this also uh, tells us that measuring cosine delta or delta in general can actually probe our flavor models. 
to get um, a global picture of the predictions of these flavor models together with my collaborators. Uh, earlier this year, I put together uh, predictions from uh, different classes of flavor models and different, different models within these classes. And this is what I show here in, in these plots. So all of these uh, little arrows and circles, these are different flavor models. And you see that the predictions for cause and delta in these models are kind of all over the place. Um, uh, in gray, you see the current allowed region for cosine and delta, which is between zero, uh, between minus and plus one. And, but in red, you see um, the uh, forecasted sensitivity of the Dune experiment. And you see that a lot of um, different flavor models can be ruled out, um, which is forecasted sensitivity of the Dune experiment, which is, of course, very exciting. And um, then a few years ago, uh, I also showed that there are flavor models which predict uh, which predict a correlation between the value of delta and the sum of the neutrino masses, which is a quantity which will be measured uh, soon with cosmology. So again, um, also this plot shows that measuring delta can uh, will be very important um, in our quest for to find like the theory of nature and maybe also an underlying rationale behind the observed um, mixings in the neutrino sector. So you let me summarize and conclude. Um, so we still have the open question of CP violation in the lepton sector. Uh, currently, two experiments, NOVA and T2K, are trying to answer this question. However, they have, with their current data, a slight tension between their results. This tension can be fully resolved by introducing new neutrino interactions, neutrino non-standard interactions. This solution predicts maximal CP violation in the PM and S matrix. We predict delta equal to 3 pi over 2, but also maximal uh, CP violation uh, for new physics because we predict the phase of um, the NSI parameters also to be 3 pi over 2. Uh, future ex oscillation experiments will definitely measure the CP violating quantity, and we are very much looking forward to that. Uh, but this, CP viola uh, this uh, CP measurement will not only tell us if CP is conserved or violated in the lepton sector, but it could potentially also tell us about flavor symmetries in the lepton sector. So in, turn, in uh, total, it will tell us more about the symmetries which are realized in nature. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julia, for your very interesting talk. And I don't have questions, comments. No. And I don't have questions, comments. Don't be shy. A few slides. Yes, there, there. Just one mm -hmm. slide, actually. Uh, no, I mean, you can go oh, yeah. another one. Yeah, this one. You okay. have in the left plot, you have this delta chi square. Mm -hmm. I don't even really understand this because you are comparing different models, right? Each of exactly. these, each of these squares or whatever, they are mm -hmm. different models. And this delta chi square is related with, I don't, I actually, I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. So this was uh, my fault. I didn't explain uh, well enough what exactly these these uh, circles and squares correspond to. Yes. So these are indeed the predictions of different models. However, these models have, as for example, they, um, they for example, need to reproduce the, the observed mixings and the masses, which means we can assign a delta chi-squared. How well does this model fit all the mixing parameters we have already measured? And these are this delta chi-squared of these models. So you can see there are models, uh, like for example, this, this square here, which fits the, op the, the current oscillation data quite well. And it predicts that cosine delta is around zero, minus 0 0.8. So if uh, delta is equal to zero, this model, even though it fits all the other oscillation parameters, will be ruled out. But there are also some models, uh, for example, this model up here, which has, uh, which doesn't fit the other oscillation parameters well. So it has a delta chi squared of 50. Um, so we will see um, if this model will actually survive uh, a measurement of, of the CP violating quantity.
Now I see. No, okay. Now it's very clear. Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, that's very okay. interesting. Actually, that's a very interesting plot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We What's have a question. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I will have a question in the chat. I can read for you if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, what explains Nova and T2K prefer normal uh, ordering and when they are combining the preferences for inverted ordering? Yes. So this is kind of a subtlety, actually. Um, yeah. So this is probably a little bit surprising. Um, so this is related uh, to the fact that uh here here you see um in color you see all of the uh values uh sorry all of the number of events um at um at t2k which are possible in color and you see the measurement and you see the measurement is outside of the possible allowed or possible values of of um of measurements and in fact that the measurement is actually a little bit outside of what is allowed. This kind of pulls um, pulls uh, T2K preference for normal ordering. And if you combine it with NOVA, it uh, pulls it in the direction of inverted ordering from what I understand. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to, um, to, to, to see. Unfortunately, I wish I would have a better explanation. <laughs> All right. I oh, think question. Yes. Hold on. Yes. Uh, hi. I want to ask you. You say that you have slight matter effects in Nova and Tokai, but they are not more as more or less like a shallow experiments. They are very close to the for the same density. Uh yes. So um. Yeah, I mean, uh, at NOVA, the neutrinos, they do propagate through matter. I mean, they, they, they propagate in a depth, depth of like 10 kilometers. So you do have matter effects both at NOVA, but also in uh, T2K, where they propagate at a depth of like one kilometer. I'm, I'm not sure if, if I understood the question correctly. Does it answer it? Uh, no, because you're using different densities, so both and... Uh, ah, sorry. So you're, you're asking about like this value, the 2.84 yeah. versus... Okay, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, so um, exactly. So this, it just turns out that the dense, the matter density uh, in Wisconsin <laughs> uh, has exactly this value, 2.84 gram per cc, whereas here in Japan, the matter density is 2.3 gram per cc. So this is just measured... Uh, that's just kind of geology. It just happens to be that in North America, um, the, the crust is denser than it is in Japan. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have another question. Yeah. Is it me? <laughs> Yes. 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 Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you Judith, for your nice talk. Uh, I, I was wondering about the limits on the epsilons coming from uh, coherent uh, scattering experiments of neutrino with nuclei. Uh, yeah. Are you taking those into account? Or are they? Do they matter? Yes. So uh, actually, yeah, actually, I actually wrote a paper about like uh, deriving these constraints ah, okay. from from seven. So it's, uh, these are actually uh, very very interesting and also very important. Um, so as I say here, the constraint uh, on epsilon on the off diagonal epsilon parameters is also of the order of t of like twenty percent. So they are not better than actually the constraints from ice cube. They are not more constraining than the constraints from ice cube. However. Um, Sevens is not sensitive to the phase of the NSI parameter. And for sevens, the sevens constraints, they only apply um, to mediators um, above a certain mass. So for coherent um, a, a sevens experiment, the mediator mass needs to be a rough, like, a, a, 
above like 10 MeV or something like this. Whereas um, NSI and oscillations, they're independent of the mediator mass because we're talking about new forward interactions of the neutrinos. So you could, for example, avoid these constraints from neutrino scattering, but just making your mediator very light such that uh, Sevens is not sensitive to it anymore. But yes, for, for like heavier mediators, they are uh, competitive uh, to oscillation constraints, yes. All right, any more questions? Yeah, Hi, thank you, Julia, for your great talk. Uh, you, you said that you estimate the parameters of NSI analytically. Sorry, I, I didn't understand how, how you do that. Can you explain again, please? Sure. Yes, yes. So the basic uh, starting point is that um, we could, uh, so the measured value is under the assumption that there is no NSI. However, if we have NSI, then this oscillation probability is, is like the measured oscillation probability without NSI is equal to the oscillation probability with NSI and the true value of delta. And uh, using like this approximate uh, expressions um, for the oscillation probability in the presence of NSI, these are lengthy, so I didn't uh, bring them. We can solve um, just this equation basically for epsilon, uh, then we obtain the, uh, like an uh, estimate for the magnitude of the NSI parameter, and we also obtain an estimate for the uh, phase of the NSI parameter. But yeah, so the starting point is basically equating these two uh, expressions with and without NSI. As a follow, I maybe as a comment to that, but then the delta true. What do you use for the delta true? Yes. So uh, we are yeah. So we are in the end we are assuming since T two K, uh, the neutrinos at T two K is uh, experience weaker matter effects such that. Um, the true value of delta is probably very close to the measured value from T to K. We just assume this as an approximation to obtain the results, for example, here for the phase of the NSI parameter. In mm -hmm. fact, it turns out, so um, it turns out numerically that the true value of delta, which is shown in this column here, is indeed very close to the preferred value from T to K around 3 pi over 2. So this was a good assumption in our uh, analytical estimates. Mm -hmm. And then, as you show in this ah, in this slide, to do that you have to do some global fit or something like that, right? Exactly. So, yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So we took into account appearance data and disappearance data, both from T2K and Nova, and we also needed to use priors on the other uh, oscillation parameters. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we do kind of a global fit. We don't do like a full global mm -hmm. fit because we are implementing uh, Daya Bay, Kamland, and Snow um, as priors mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not, we are not fitting to the data itself. We mm -hmm. are just uh, fitting basically to the Nova and T2K data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it gets relatively close um, to a global fit indeed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And for curiosity to do that, you did that yourselves? Do you use globes or something like that? So we did not use globes. We used our own uh, oscillation code. Okay. Uh, however, there was, uh, you see here, another reference, uh, Chatterjee and Palazzo. They also came out a little bit after us and they are actually using globes. So they implemented everything into globes. Um, but it turns out it's actually not necessary to use globes for that. You can also just use your Python C++ oscillation <laughs> code. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's very nice, yes. <laughs> Further questions, comments? Well, if not, let's yeah. thank Julia again. Thank you for your yeah. very nice talk. Okay, thanks a lot for the invitation. Yeah.
Uh, can I stop the recording?